Welcome to the On Your Mind podcast, where we believe mental illness can be temporary and transformative. Stay tuned for innovative, effective tools from experts in the field of mental health. Hosted by Timothy J. Hayes, psychologist. This podcast aims to change the narrative around mental illness. Move from a place of fear to a place of hope and solutions. Here on On Your Mind. My next guest is L. Richard Burusama. Richard is founder and CEO of Insight Neurosystems, which markets and provides support for health professionals using the BAUD. The BAUD is the bioacoustical utilization device. Richard trains and supports psychologists, physical therapists, chiropractors, and doctors worldwide in applying the device clinically and has spearheaded research activities and experimental applications of acoustical neuromodulation to many chronic problems such as Parkinson's, Guillain-Barre, stroke, paralysis, chronic pain, and neurological disorders of all types. Mr. Brusima has also initiated and consulted on fMRI and other brain imaging studies of acoustical neuromodulation therapy and collected clinical data for a study presented at the 2010 Conference of the International Society for Neurotherapy Research. He is the author of Resetting the Fear Switch in PTSD, a novel treatment using acoustical neuromodulation to modify memory reconsolidation. New Technique shows promise as adjunct in chronic pain management, published in Practical Pain Management. Also an article titled Acoustical Neuromodulation for Chronic Pain Management, published in The Pain Practitioner. He's also authored the BAUD Therapist Manual. So Richard, welcome. Thank you for joining us today. Well, thanks for having me, Tim. I'm glad to be here. So how did you get involved in this, uh, the BAUD? Well, uh, sort of accidentally, uh, I had actually owned and published a, a magazine, Kansas City Parent Magazine, for some years and simply and just sold it. And I was helping another psychologist um, who had developed a, a product for parents with ADD children. Uh, and he asked me to fly down and, and speak with Dr. Frank Lawless with him. Uh, as he was helping Frank with the project. And Frank, of course, is a, uh, an expert in the field of ADD, ADHD. And he was providing some uh, content for this fellow. Anyway, we met at his house down in Denton, Texas, and got to talking about things. And I explained a little bit about uh, what I had discovered about marketing on the web through affiliate marketing, which this was... Uh, quite some time ago. It wasn't quite as popular as it is today. Frank got excited and he said, you know, let me go get something. He went out into the car and dug around in the trunk of his car and came back in with this little gray device uh, about the size of a transistor radio. This is actually the current version of it, the BOD, uh, for bioacoustical utilization device. Well, Frank went on and on about uh, all the things that he was seeing the BOD do in his clinical uh, use for it. Uh, he had developed it specifically for ADD, but he said, this thing uh, can help people with uh, depression and anxiety and, and overeating and addictions. And he went on and on and on. And I kind of rolled my eyes and said, okay, uh, that's, a, that's a lot to swallow. I was really pretty skeptical. Well, he showed me how to use it and he gave me one. He said, take it home and use it um, and tell me what you think later. So I did, I packed it away and took it home, didn't think too much about it for a few weeks. Uh, and then at one point I was having some uh, emotional reactivity uh, in my marriage, you know, hot buttons getting pushed. I thought, let me give this thing a try. So I sat down and I tuned it in like he had instructed me and simply focused on the issue and generating those feelings for about 10 minutes, turned it off, the feelings were gone. I thought, this is really peculiar. I said, did he like give me a post-hypnotic suggestion or whatever? So then throughout the next couple of days, uh, those hot buttons continued to be pushed. And every time they did, I sat and I waited for that reaction to come and it just didn't come. And I thought, this is very peculiar. It's like, what happened here? 
So then I started thinking there may be something to it, even though my logical mind said, how can sound affect the brain, you know, in such a profound way? So then I enlisted my family and then I enlisted my friends over the coming months to try it out because we all have some kinds of issues that we just like to get rid of, you know, whether it's nightly cravings or you know, chronic pain. And one after the other, we kept, I kept getting reports that this thing is working and they were just as surprised as I was. And so after about six months and I had been testing this thing intensely, um, and I have a, a, I really have a, a great big basket of things to test it on. I had a very dysfunctional childhood, lots of emotional things that I've learned to regulate over the years, but they're still there. And now one by one, I was sitting down with the bot and they were just kind of like falling away. And I thought, this is like the most amazing thing ever. So I thought, I'm going to take this out and I'm going to sort of share this with therapists because uh, I've never heard of anything like it. And I, I had just sold a business, as I mentioned, and so I, I put together another little business and went out to conferences and started uh, presenting it and was met, of course, with the same skepticism that I had because it's such a, uh, uh, there's a cognitive sort of uh, gap, I guess, that you look at this, you go, I just don't see how they could possibly work. And yet it does. So that started me on the path. Uh, first of all, I got a number of therapists interested, uh, really the early adopters, uh, which comprise, well, maybe 15, 20%. You know, the rest were just like, ah, you know, I don't believe in that, yada, yada, yada. And uh, I did take it to the uh, uh, ISNR conference, which is uh, therapists who are really integrating neurotherapy. And they were much more sort of, uh, persuaded by it. In particular, when Frank uh, presented a paper there, Frank is, is quite well known in the community. He's, he's got uh, uh, really a, a amazing credentials. Um, and he's been doing this stuff since really, he's been in practice with this since probably about the time I was born. He was in the 60s. He was like one of the first mind-body psychologists. And his work, he's, he's uh, served on the faculty of uh, different universities, five different medical schools, uh, specialized in, in pain psychology for a long time, which is kind of how he stumbled on the block. But that was my introduction to it. I was really so taken with it, seeing its effect and being just amazed that there was anything out there that could literally um, seemingly erase uh, unwanted feelings that I took it out there and a number of psych a number of therapists of course incorporated into the practice and I began to get feedback and they're going, wow, this is amazing. How does it work? And the ones that were skeptical kept saying, well, how could it possibly work? I didn't have an answer for that. So really uh, this was in about 2007. And since that time I've been sort of immersed in research and, um, working with uh, uh, other therapists doing studies to try to actually figure out what's going on. And I think we have a pretty good handle on it right now. Um, that the BOD is working by disrupting the reconsolidation of memory circuits in the brain. And by memory circuit, by memory, we have to sort of expand most people's concept of memory. We have uh, historical memory, which is, yes, I remember what I did yesterday. And then there's implicit memory in which the memory is uh, um, of feelings, of sensations, of uh, it's, it's really encoded in a whole different way. And it's those circuits, for example, that cause the problems with PTSD. PTSD is really a problem where the traumatic experience happens, uh, the brain memory circuits get sensitized and they stay firing at, uh, we'll call it high volume. Uh, so it's really a, a problem that the memory doesn't resolve. The brain plasticity has been interrupted uh, in that plasticity means both to respond to the situation of high trauma and then reset to normal. So we're seeing a maladaptive plasticity in which 
traumatic experiences or chronic pain or constant stimulation through addiction sets up these sensitized circuits in the brain and really drives the problem uh, in large part. Um, and so really for about the last 12 years, uh, I've been working with therapists to try to really define what's going on and seeing some pretty amazing results. Wonderful. So <clears throat> do you have a, um, a primary way that you get information out about this, that you expose either therapists or the general public to the existence of the BOD and how to use it? Well, we do have a website uh, called bodtherapy.com in which I've listed uh, lots of uh, results, uh, testimonials from therapists and users, uh, links to studies, as well as to media. You know, interestingly, Frank, Dr. Frank Lawless, is, um, uh, was uh, Dr. Phil's mentor uh, or advisor when he went from law into psychology and they bonded. So Dr. Lawless works with Dr. Phil and the bond has been presented on the Dr. Phil show several times. It's been on the doctors. Uh, it's been on Oprah. It's been on some national television, but really the interesting thing and the unfortunate thing with the bond is that there's no big money behind it. Um, like from a, a pharmaceutical company that would help drive it into mainstream acceptance. And so that acceptance is going to come, I think it has been coming pretty slowly, although we've laid a pretty credible foundation now with studies. Um, another colleague of mine, uh, Dr. George Lindenfeld, has really been leading the way. Uh, he's really committed to, he's seen the results of this, first of all, with PTSD. In fact, when I first talked to him about it years ago, he called me up. <clears throat> he heard about it from his daughter, who is also a therapist. And, he, and uh, so he started using it. And he called me up and he said, you know, I, I hate to admit this, but I've spent 45 years as a therapist. And when I see the results of the bot compared to my therapy, I feel like I've hardly been doing anything because he was seeing folks with severe PTSD symptomology. Um, they seen the symptoms remit within just a one or two or three sessions. So this is really a dramatically different result than we get from, from almost any other therapy. Although it does share some commonality with, with other therapies. Uh, so George really has led the way in credibility He's had uh, several published studies in peer-reviewed journals and has just had another one accepted in military psychology, which is an APA journal. So we're, we're having, by peer-reviewed, of course, that means um, other experts in the field are looking at this and finding it all credible. And part of the way we do that is that the studies are not only based on anecdotal evidence and self-reporting, but on accepted uh, metrics like CAPS-5 uh, studies and um, even brain imaging, where we can actually see uh, dramatic shifts in brain function, particularly in those areas that affect PTSD. So what type of brain imaging are you talking about? Is that QEEG neurofeedback or is that functional MRI? What imaging are they? Well, we, we have, uh, my daughter actually was in a clinical psych program at Kansas uh, University working in the imaging lab. She did uh, a study with an fMRI uh, using the BOD. Uh, most of the imaging uh, due to the expense has been uh, EEG and Loretta imaging. Loretta being a low resolution tomography analysis. It, it, it gives a picture of what's happening in the deeper part of the brain because EEG really just measures the, the electrical activity on the outside of the brain. Excellent. So can you give a little how-to? How is this used? It's a little device. It's yes. called the bioacoustical well, utilization device. So yes. um, how would you like to just introduce the audience to how it would be used by an individual? Uh, sure, it's very simple, and, and that's part of the reason that I think acceptance has been lagging because it's, it's um, deceptively simple. Um, 
first of all, the, uh, this, is, this device is really like a happy accident. Dr. Lawless was looking for a device that would aid children with ADD, ADHD uh, as an entrainment device to stimulate the brain in a certain way. <clears throat> and uh, he did find that this was effective, but because he's an experimental sort of guy, he started seeing other results that were very interesting in how it worked with emotions and so forth. Um, the way it's used is um, basically to set the two volume knobs, left and right volume for each ear. Then we have an activator uh, knob, which sets a tone. And the user, for example, if they're feeling anxiety, would sit down. Um, and if they're not feeling it, we would try to generate that. <clears throat> for example, I have someone with a spider phobia, think of a spider or look at a picture of a spider and actually stimulate the feeling because only when the feeling is stimulated is that neural circuit firing. And what we know about brain, plast brain plasticity right now is that only when the circuit is firing can it be modified. So the bottom line slogan is you have to feel it to heal it. And so while that anxiety is being felt, they will tune the activator frequency very slowly until they feel... Now just to clarify, let me interrupt you and clarify, they put on a set of headphones that are plugged into the baud. Yes. And so they are hearing through the headphones a specific signal and yes. then they start tuning that signal. Yes. This is completely auditory, ordinary sound with two different tones, one in each ear. <clears throat> so it is a binaural device, but it's also uh, a bit more. They will tune the activator frequency until they feel a slight stimulation of that anxiety. And so we found a frequency that helps to stimulate that circuit. And interestingly, by the way, how does sound stimulate a neural circuit? Well, it's converted into electrical signals within the auditory canal. And we know there's actually two routes that, that, that those signals take. One is to the auditory thalamus, conscious evaluation of a sound. So you hear you know, a rustling in the bush over there. And you go, what is that? You consciously evaluate it. But the other is unconscious. The, every sound we hear passes through the limbic system and is evaluated by the I'm sorry, amygdala, which is the sentinel organ that, uh, designed to perceive threat and create a fight or flight response. We know that because we could be sitting here and someone could throw a firecracker behind us and we would duck before we knew it was happening. Uh, the same is true of physical sensation. If we placed our hand on a hot stove, we'd pull it back before we realized and could consciously think it was hot because that's an instinctive self-preservation self response. So we know there's a direct line from the auditory canal to the amygdala, and that's what we're piggybacking on. This is a theoretical, but at this point, we've seen such dramatic change in the amygdala. We know we have a direct effect. The second, so there's, there's two parts. You set the, the volume, you create the uh, resonant tone, and then you slowly, the user would slowly tune the disruptor. That's another tone which creates an actual beat. And when the pulse of that beat is close to the rhythm of the firing of that circuit, what they feel is that anxiety just drops like dramatically. So it's completely tuned by the user. Um, even though Frank uh, Lawless in his clinic will use an EEG, and I was actually able to witness at one point how they would have the EEG hookup and we would see deficits in certain brain areas. And as someone tuned the baud while they were on the EEG, we could watch the reading shift. It was pretty amazing. So that's really as simple as it is. We find the right frequencies that seem to neutralize the feeling. And here we're using the brain as a monitor which is a much better monitor than an EEG or anything else we have. I like to describe it as, oh, the mental part of it, by the way, is for the uh, user simply to focus on the feeling. Let's say it's a pain. They would simply focus their contention completely on it in a very non-reactive way and try to remain calm. So it's really like, the protocol is very much like mindfulness. Uh, 
with a little technological enhancement. But very simple to learn, very simple for most users to, to do on their own. What percentage of people that, if you have any statistics on this, what percentage of people that try the BOD um, like it versus don't like it? Because I know certain people are very sensitive to sound and they yes. reject the use of a device like that. Do you have any, any awareness of what the, the rates are for people rejecting it as well, a technique? Yes. In fact, in one of the studies I co-authored uh, with a, uh, a doctor of physical therapy, um, he worked with patients who had a high degree of central sensitization. And a good number of them found the bot sound to be aversive and didn't want to hear it. Because it's not a pleasant sound. It's kind of like it's been described as angry buzzing bees by some people. Um, but there's a point to that. Now, what's happening there is the bod both stimulates the amygdala and it stimulates uh, a disruption of the circuitry there. But in the stimulation of it, many people find that that's uncomfortable. Um, and so there are, there's a minority of people that have high sensitization that simply can't tolerate the sound. Now, here's an interesting story. My wife was one of those. She had suffered for many years with uh, fibromyalgia. And again, the methodology of how the brain becomes sensitized is constant pain sensitizes those circuits to be always on. She put the ball on. I said, try this. It's supposed to be good for pain. She turned it on, made a face, ripped the headphones off and threw them across the room and said, I'm never putting that thing on again. It was awful. And what happened was the sudden stimulation, I think, uh, really activated a lot of the pain circuits that, that we can compartmentalize and keep really out of our consciousness. The interesting thing is when she saw what was happening with the rest of the family, everybody else getting results, she wanted to give it another try. And so we, walked, we worked with setting some headphones off to the side, lowering the volume. She took it in small amounts. And eventually, uh, now she can use it at high volume in an ordinary way. But when the bot effect sets in, first there's the stimulation, and then there's the neutralization. Uh, I would say the number of people that can't tolerate the sound is very, very small, maybe two or three percent. Um, as far as effectiveness, I have uh, uh, not for the past five years or so, but I did several surveys early on with the board. And uh, therapists reported in both cases, the numbers were very close. 76% uh, reported pa uh, patients getting good to excellent results. Uh, and I quantified that as uh, at least half to most of the symptom was, was uh, relieved. Wonderful. So uh, do you have a sense, are you getting active feedback from therapists that are using it in the field about the, the kinds of symptomatology that they're targeting the most with the BOD? Well, because most of our customers are psychologists and neurotherapists, and a minority of them are physical therapists or MDs, um, most of the feedback is on um, psychotherapy types of issues. But we're getting feedback across the spectrum. Uh, and what we're finding is very interesting. And this actually suggests that the BOD has implications, not just for uh, therapy and emotions, but for physical medicine. Uh, we're getting reports back that it can relieve pain in a very profound way. Um, also, uh, addictive behaviors, um, and as well as, as um, primarily anxiety, it seems to be the best, or at least the most popular target for the BOD. But we've also done, Tim, some experimental use of the BOD uh, because really it is so safe. It FDA approved and it's really 
the side effects from this, the only thing we've ever heard would be maybe a slight headache or sometimes a little dizziness from the binaural effect. Um, so really there's a no-lose uh, proposition. We've seen it improve um, stroke symptoms from balance to weakness. Uh, on the website, there's actually a video of a fellow with tremors. And as he tunes the bod, you can actually see the tremor diminish to almost nothing. Uh, we've had a lot of feedback uh, on Parkinson's and other tremors. Doesn't seem to matter the cause of it. The bod is able to reduce them, not eliminate them. Um, and of course, uh, a variety, interestingly, of, of problems that um, really were never diagnosed. There was no label for them. Uh, but they had a neurological component, and the bod has been able to help. Um, also, um, irritable bowel syndrome, um, a variety of other things that, that we've seen. So what we found here, and, and I'd like to just make a, a sort of a, um, a statement based on my years of experience with this. I really believe <clears throat> the principle that we're working with here is going to be, once it's fully understood and embraced, it's going to change uh, um, psychology, psychotherapy as much or more than the introduction of medications. And a lot of physical medicine, pain, pain treatment, um, right now, which is, is just so problematic with the opioids, they, they don't work for everyone and they, are addictive as all get out. We've had a number of case reports of people um, able to, do, to reduce or even go off of opioid medication. I can tell you about one is very interesting if you want to hear. Please. Uh, his name is Klaus. Klaus is a Swedish fella who contacted me by email and told me his story. His story is that he contacted Guillain-Barre syndrome at the age of 55. Now, Guillain-Barre is a, an autoimmune response that, that gets triggered in the body, where the body then uh, attacks itself and also somehow degrades the sheath around the nervous system. He had such a severe case of it that he was in the hospital. Uh, he lost his breathing ability. He was on a ventilator for five days. He couldn't move anything but his eyelids. Uh, but as usual, they... they these victims, they recover from it. So he recovered partially. He was paralyzed from the knees down, didn't have any sensation uh, below that, except for ongoing excruciating level eight or nine pain most days. So Klaus was on a regimen of oxycodone daily. Several times a week, he self-administered morphine. And several times a year, he had to go into the hospital for high dose morphine where they had to monitor his respiration in order to try to knock down the pain. I honestly didn't know if it could work in, in this case, uh, but I loaned him a bod and, and walked him through it over Skype. And a week later, uh, I, I was wondering about him. I hadn't heard back from him. He uh, contacted me and told me that he had done the bod three times. His painless level was down to one or two. He was going off of his oxycodone and morphine. And I was, I mean, I am still surprised at some of these results because they're so um, <laughs> unexpected. There's, the, the mind goes, how is that possible? Um, that he couldn't get relief any other way. Well, what we know about now, again, um, sensitization, chronic pain, uh, can create central sensitization in which the pain itself becomes the problem. His body actually had healed up enough to where the pain circuits um, in the peripheral system weren't even firing much anymore. It was all in the brain, it kept getting triggered in the brain. Klaus, uh, he would, needless to say, he was thrilled and he started sending letters out to other Guillain-Barre groups and so forth. But that was just an extreme example. That was, by the way, after 15 years, he contacted me when he was 70. So he had been on this regimen for 15 years. Well, that's a delightful story. And it makes me wanna ask, 
do you know about the work of Dr. John Sarno? Um, possibly. So the work of Dr. John Sarno as a back surgeon who wanted to find out what was the most effective part of the surgeries that he did. And he did a study that had him look at the scans of a whole lot of people. And what he was forced to conclude at the end of that study was that nothing he was doing in his back surgery was relieving the pain that people had because 65% of the people that were in this study that had spinal scans with the CAT scans and the x-rays and the MRIs, mm -hmm. they had the things that we would normally call curvature of the spine, bulging, ruptured, herniated discs, mm -hmm. arthritis, bone spurs, pinched nerves, et cetera, evidence of previous fractures in vertebrae, et cetera. And only 35% of those people had any pain or discomfort. 65% of the people that had all that same stuff on their scans of their spines and their back had no restriction of motion and no pain. So he was forced to conclude that what's showing up on the scans is not responsible for the pain. And he started trying to research, so what is going on? And he discovered what he called tension myoneural syndrome, which means the mental, emotional body, the physical brain decides to get tighter tense because of some threat or it lodge, lodges some traumatic energy in the body. And the muscle tension or the, the small packets of muscles as they contract restrict blood flow to tissue. And what he yeah. discovered is that the smallest, even a 10% decrease in oxygen flow to tissue is enough to generate excruciating pain. So he quit doing back surgery and started doing a psychoeducational approach. And as a good back surgeon, his results were about 35% complete reduction of, of pain, complete elimination of pain and restoration of motion. And that's a pretty good, well, and, and the third factor there is no need for an additional surgery. Yes. So that's a really good rate for a back surgeon, 35, 36, 38, 40%. Most of us would say that's not a very good rate, but when you yeah. consider the fact that even a, a larger percent end up getting complete elimination of pain and complete restoration of motion, but in four or five years, they've got to go have another surgery to get rid of the scar tissue that's built up or whatever. When he quit doing surgeries altogether and moved to this psychoeducational model, his success rate went above 80%. Oh. So he's written books, and, and it's Dr. John Sarno, S-A-R-N-O. He's no longer with us. He left his body a, a year or so ago. So people can get access to that through his books. And you can also go, and there was a documentary that was completed just before he died, so he got to see it. And that documentary is available online for five or six bucks cool. at All the Rage DOC, All the Rage Documentary, DOC.com. So it's all one word, All the Rage DOC.com. Mm -hmm. And my supposition is that when you're talking about memory reconsolidation, which is something I've read quite a bit about beginning with depth-oriented brief therapy by um, Bruce Ecker and his yes. wife, Laurel Hulley. Yes. And, and then later, uh, their next book, which was, uh, it'll come to me. Um, and now that's called Coherence Therapy. Yes. And they're doing tremendous studies with this memory reconsolidation. What they're talking about, what they've discovered is very much like what you said. I have to let myself feel the energy flowing through those yes. physical and emotional circuits. And once I tap into that, it opens a window during which time yes. reconsolidation of the memory, rewriting of the neural pathways contained in that memory is possible. Now, it's not enough to just have a reactivation of that 
neural pathway as anybody yeah. who's had traumatic flashbacks from post-traumatic stress disorder will tell you. You can have flashbacks for years and not have anything re be resolved. Yeah. In the hands of a skilled therapist who knows about the process of trauma, who knows how to help someone avoid re-traumatization, yes. tools, a variety of different techniques that can help you step into memory reconsolidation are are what makes this possible. And I have found that the BAUD is one of those many tools. Yes, I agree. And in fact, uh, many of the therapists we work with work with uh, modalities like EMDR, for example, or EFT. Um, and uh, EMDR, I've seen, uh, it's beginning to be described as a memory reconsolidation therapy. We have these therapies that have worked. In fact, Dr. Joseph Ledoux, who's a professor of neuroscience at uh, New York University. He's kind of the father of memory reconsolidation. Actually, his grad student, Karen Nader, uh, came to him one day and said, let's see if we can erase uh, memories in a rat. And he goes, oh, they've tried that. You can never do it. This was back really in the late 90s uh, where we thought the brain was hardwired. Once that's set in there, there's nothing you can do. Well, uh, Karen Nader, did an experiment where he was able to seemingly erase a pain memory in rats, or a fear memory, I'm sorry. Um, and so that was amazing. So they repeated and repeated it. But Joseph Ledoux is, is actually described what you're saying in that anytime a memory is reactivated, there's one of three things that can happen. It can stay the same, it can become stronger, the re-traumatizing that you mentioned, or it can become weaker. Um, the question is, in cases of these uh, um, pathological circuits, how do we weaken them? How do we get there? Uh, coherence therapy is, is a talk therapy based on the neural, uh, the memory consolidation model. So understanding what happens, they'll activate it, and then I believe um, try to switch the attention away well, to update. Let me, let me just clarify that because... I'm very familiar with coherence therapy and th there are all kinds of things flooding, you know, in, into me as a therapist and a clinical person, uh, I want to say 17 different things now so that people don't race okay. off and re-traumatize themselves. There are yes. books like um, The Body Remembers by Babette Rothschild, which is a really good book to be gentle with yourself to do the kind of awareness that your wife had when she threw the headphones across the room, right? Instead of just trying to tough it out and keep it there and then gradually come back in and desensitize. Yes. So what's happening in the coherence therapy model is they juxtapose one implicit emotional memory with another because most of us function at a, fairly high level and then um, a traumatic memory will get triggered and and we will not function so well in one setting or another and so when you when you go into coherence therapy which is not just talk therapy it's this experiential memory reconsolidation based process you cannot simply talk about your traumas and have them go away yeah. As you said earlier, you have to reactivate the feeling. You have to be helping the person experience it in a safe environment and then alternate back and forth, or as they say in that work, juxtapose one felt truth. I'm okay. I've survived. I've made it to 65 years of age with mm -hmm. another deep implicit truth. I'm not okay. I'm in danger. Life is threatening. And I alternate quickly back and forth between those once the deep emotional trauma has been activated, that window that you talked about is open. Yes. And as I juxtapose these inner knowings within myself, I know both to be true and they're contradictory. The longer I hold them in conscious awareness in that safe space, moving back and forth, the more the brain reconsolidates and says, oh, these can't both possibly be true. So what's the actual truth? And that shift happens, the yeah. rewriting in the, in the neural plasticity, et cetera. So I just wanted to specify a couple things there. One is be gentle with yourself 
if you if you are if you've had serious trauma, and you're considering um, looking into the BOD, uh, I strongly recommend that you do it in the, with the coaching of a therapist who's well versed in the processes of trauma and its resolution from a very gentle, effective approach. And I think the BOD is one of the most powerful tools to be added in the arsenal, along yeah. with the emotional freedom technique that you mentioned, and EMDR, mm -hmm. and some people use the bio um, energetic synchronization technique, which is another mind-body energy process. Yeah. Um, so just wanted to put that in there as we're talking about how this, this device is available for individuals to use. Yes. Yeah. Well, and thanks for clarifying that, Tim. Um, we always, uh, we always uh, instruct BOD users, if your problem is clinical level, and by that, I mean it's not, um, say, mild anxiety or overeating or wanting to quit smoking. I mean, there's some problems people can tackle on their own with the BOD uh, easily. Uh, if you have bipolar disorder, I mean, if you're having schizophrenic, I mean, if you've got a serious problem, you absolutely, even PTSD, uh, particularly complex PTSD, um, you will want an experienced and expert therapist to, to guide you in this process. Um, interestingly, uh, Joseph Ledoux, I, I think part of what we're discovering here, when you, you named all the modalities that are memory oriented modalities. Uh, another one, which is actually a uh, drug centered propranolol is a beta blocker that, that uh, medical science is experimenting with for PTSD. It actually chemically inhibits the reconsolidation of neural pathways. So they administer this to veterans and then have them relive and talk about their experience. Uh, and so in many ways, the model is the same. We're looking to really change those circuits back to normal function. Uh, and just one little aside, Joseph Ledoux that I mentioned earlier, made the interesting observation that he thinks all talk therapy is really memory reconsolidation therapy. And that one of the ways that, that that's obvious is when, because you said you can't just talk about these and expect change. Well, what's one of the most common phrases that a therapist will ask their patient? How do you feel about that? And what they're saying is activate the emotional circuit so that we can maybe modify that and change that. So I think in some ways, what we're doing now is looking what it, at what has worked and trying to decide how it's worked. And the bot is really just one of a number of different things. It's really a, a safe and rapid, uh, effective tool. But I think the principle that all of these operate by the principle in the brain is going to be really the the basis of huge changes in mental health and even things like pain therapy yeah i i agree and I, i've seen a lot of it in my practice i've had the uh the blessing of being introduced to a number of these techniques and um, i'm grateful to the person that told me about the board a couple of years ago um Actually, it's only about a year and a half ago, I think. Um, Unlocking the Emotional Brain is the second book by um, Bruce Ecker and Laurel Hulley and Robin Tissick as they moved from calling it um, the depth-oriented brief therapy to coherence therapy, and they published that second book. And again, a lot of research is happening. And what they're discovering is when there's a lasting shift made, whether it's just from talking to somebody or having a deep experience or using something like the BOD, probably what's happened is a memory has been reconsolidated. Neural yeah. rewiring has taken place. Yes. What is it about the BOD that I haven't even mentioned yet? What, you know, as we'll wind down this interview, what, what else would you like to say that maybe I haven't even asked you about yet? Um, well, I think we've covered a, a good part of it. I mean, the, uh, there are many case studies that are very interesting um, and that, again, they suggest 
that what we know about things like stroke and even paralysis uh, is not complete yet. I actually worked with a young lady who was a quadriplegic, a tetraplegic, uh, for 10 years. She contacted me. She was trying to, uh, she was applying for a, uh, uh, to be accepted into a neuropsychology program, PhD program. And she read about the BOD and was very interested in trying it herself. She was in a wheelchair. She had, uh, she was not a, a complete uh, um, injury, not complete tetraplegic. She had some control over her arm muscles, but her hands were clasped and, and she couldn't walk. So she wanted to see if the BOD could do anything for her. And I said, just don't know. Uh, possibly. We did have one sort of odd report from a clinic in Switzerland where a lady was using the BOD on an emotional issue and she was in a wheelchair as well. And she suddenly perked up and said, I can feel something that I couldn't feel for the last 30 years. And somehow some sensation came to life in her lower uh, pelvic region. So I said, let's give it a try. There's really no harm. And, and uh, this lady, Lisa, was an athlete. She was quite disciplined and she was ready to give it her all. Um, uh, an athlete before she was uh, injured unfortunately by a bullet wound, at some stray bullet that someone fired at a party. Um, so we started working on this. And one of the first things we're able to do, a lot of people don't realize that uh, paralysis often brings uh, neurogenic pain. That when the brain is not getting any signals from the legs, it often sort of senses there's something wrong and interprets that as pain. So a lot of paraplegic and tetraplegics will have uh, light to even severe uh, neurogenic pain. Uh, Lisa's was just moderate, but we were able to eliminate that really with one session on each leg, uh, which was pretty amazing and delightful to her. The other things she wanted to do were much more ambitious. She, her greatest goal, of course, was to get use of her hands back. Um, we didn't accomplish that, but what we did accomplish through applying uh, some of the latest research and techniques they're using, um, using electricity, we were able for Lisa to regain sensation in her hands. She could actually feel again for the first time in 10 years, which she was delighted about. And so that, uh, the stroke recovery um, and, and others suggest there's a lot more going on with the circuitry in the brain because we know that people can rehabilitate from stroke with physical therapy. Theoretically, they can grow new neurons to replace the injured ones. But what we're seeing here, for example, um, with an 83 year old fellow, uh, um, man that I worked with personally, uh, who had lost uh, balance completely on one side of his body, it was very bothersome to him. Within five minutes, we were able to get that back almost completely. You can't grow neurons in five minutes. So something else was going on. And so I started putting questions out to doctors that I worked with. It's like, if, if everybody's stroke is different and in a different area of the brain, why is it the same set of symptoms? Balance, weakness, speech, swallowing. Those areas of the brain can't be affected in everybody. Well, they didn't really have an answer to that. And so my theory is that it's the, that the trauma of the physical problem, like the trauma of emotional trauma of PTSD, somehow shocks the brain and the circuits uh, are just somehow impaired. And so we're seeing things that should take a long time uh, to heal coming back quickly. Beyond that, uh, with the BOD, I'm not sure what else to say. I mean, there's, there's so much going on right now. Research continues. Uh, it's being applied uh, right now in 23 countries around the world. Uh, based on the last survey, uh, an estimated 1 million uh, clinical uses. So we have a lot of data that has been given back to us anecdotally. We have now uh, assembling studies that are being published. Uh, 
but in the meantime, it works. All right, wonderful. I'm, I'm so glad that you were willing to talk with us about this to get some of this information out there. One more time, would you give us the website where people can go to find out more about it or purchase a BAUD? Sure. It's called BAUD Therapy, B-A-U-D therapy.com. Uh, you'll find all sorts of information uh, there and the ability to order through. And again, we do recommend uh, you work with your therapist. I have uh, worked personally coaching therapists with the background of it. And so they could monitor and work with their patients. And I'm happy to do that as well. Great. And, and my recommendation to people is to uh, go check out the website. But also, uh, if you're working with a therapist, uh, let her know about this. Let him know about it. Um, Richard, I greatly appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Um, I look forward to catching up in a year or two to see where it's taken us. Thank you, Tim. And I look forward to hearing later about some of your successes with the board. Well, well, we'll do it. We'll schedule another time. Thanks so much for the time. You're most welcome. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. You've been listening to the On Your Mind podcast, offered by Journey's Dream, where we support people through mental health challenges to a place of true and lasting well-being. If you love our show, we invite you to visit onyourmindpodcast.org to join the conversation access the show notes, and discover our helpful resources. Thank you for listening.